Thank you for coming. It's lovely to be in such a gorgeous space, especially a space that has a thing saying the Chrysalis Club up there, which is great for um, butterfly fans like myself. Here we go, coastline. So um, Britain has an incredibly diverse coast, but I didn't know until two and a half years ago when I started researching this new book, Coastlines, that we have such a long coast, and um, it's actually longer than India's. It's incredible. It's 12,000 miles long, and the coast of India, I don't know if you can see see that little run down there, but um, um, it's, it's longer than the coast of India. Ah, that's what I wanted. The sands of time, you see, are running out. Um, and <laughs> Bosnia-Herzegovina are bringing up the rear with, with, with 14 miles there. Now, um, the coast of England, Wales, and Northern Ireland is about 3,000 miles long, and 50 years ago, the largest landowner um, of, of that coast was the Ministry of Defence. Today, it's the National Trust. They own 775 miles of that coast. And so I set out to explore our changing relationship with the coast through some adventures around the bits that are protected by the National Trust. And obviously, the coast is kind of quite well-trodden territory in film and telly and books and so on. So I hope to do something slightly different and look at it thematically. So I look at the coast and childhood and how we, um, how we change in the way we relate to the coast at different points in our lives. So the coast and childhood, the coast and romance, and falling in love and then adult themes so how we work by the coast these are the old tin mu tin mines of Tintagel, of, of Batalic rather, in, in Penwith in Cornwall, which are kind of rendered picturesque with the passing of time. And I also look at the human endeavour that's probably shaped the human character of our coast more than any other, which is war and our fear of invasion. And so this has really marked our coast. In, and this is beautiful castle of Dunstanborough up on the Northumberland coast, which has to be the equal of of the Cornish coast, I'd say, in terms of beauty. And I also look at the coast and art and how it's inspired artists and poets. And this is one of the National Trust less, um, less sort of um, typical properties. It's a damp old stone cottage on the end of the Clin Peninsula that overlooks a beach called Hell's Mouth. And it was owned, or rather leased, to the poet R.S. Thomas, the great Welsh nationalist poet in the 1970s and 80s. And it still exists today in very much the state it was in when he lived there. It's incredible incredibly um, run down and cold and damp and it was so cold that R.S. Thomas's son Gwydion once visited him and found him writing poetry at his desk in, in this place and there was mould growing on his jacket shoulders. It was so cold and damp and, and R.S. Thomas's wife Elsie was a, was a very talented painter and um, she could only keep warm by um, when she painted by putting her feet inside a cardboard box that also had an electric heater inside it. And, she got very badly burned one day from this contraption, which is unfortunate. But I also wanted to look at why so many of us seek to return to the seaside later in life, why we often seek to retire by the sea, why we find solace by the sea, and why so many of us, um, why, why the coast is sort of bound up in religious questing and spiritual questing. And that really brings me to the starting point of our kind of changing relationship throughout history with the coast. And it's easy to forget we're in the kind of third century of a grand passion for the seaside, but it wasn't always thus. In fact, for most of the last 2,000 years, we've feared and despised the sea and this is very much rooted in Christian teaching and in the Old Testament and the sea is evidence that God's work is unfinished on the planet and the sea is the source of monsters and devilry and the sea is an instrument of divine punishment in Noah's Ark so for centuries the sea was something that everyone avoided apart from those who were unfortunate enough to be condemned to eco living from it such as fishermen who were seen as very hapless creatures indeed and the only other people who really sought out the coast apart from fishermen and traders were these guys monks and hermits and the British coast is actually the birthplace of hermetic life in Britain it's where St Cuthbert set up a cell on the inner farm um, and, and basically lived a solitary life by the sea. And I, I sort of assumed that he went there, that these hermits went there for great peace and tranquility, but it was, in fact, it was almost exactly the opposite. They considered themselves, the, these early hermits, to be frontline soldiers in the war against evil, and the sea was um, to, to, to base yourself on an uninhabited island like Inner Farn here, like St Cuthbert did, was, that was obviously very physically challenging, but it was also the most spiritual challenging place they could be. It was where they would sort of do battle with the devil and evil and pray for the good of people living much more comfortably in land. But our relationship with the sea was transformed in the 18th century and it saw the rise of the great 
craze for sea bathing. Um, every sort of doctor and quack prescribed sea bathing as a cure for all kinds of ills, so, um, of which there is, is a rational basis. You know, we know now that salt water is very good for us. But there was also a great, um, with the dawn of the Romantic era, there was a great discovery of the coast. And um, through poets like Byron and Shelley, and also painters like J.M.W. Turner here, and these are some of the images that he painted on a trip down to Cornwall. And these kind of paintings that he brought back to London, um, which were designed to whet patriotic appetites in the long war against France. They were as foreign to people's eyes then as perhaps images from Mars are to us today. It was an unvisited land. And the thing that the Romantics gloried in, they still found the sea a terrifying, horrific place, but they kind of gloried in the immense immensity of it and the power of it. And um, the thing that they really sought out in Cornwall and the thing that the first tourists went to Cornwall for wasn't the Cornwall coves and the surf and the golden sand that we go for today it was um, the rocks it was the granite and these wonderful rocks and these you can sort of see how these rocks might be considered to be groups of people looking out to the west they're often called the guardians of the western coast and there's these lovely granite rock formations all along the Cornish coast there but where the romantics led of course the rest of us followed and so you get the development of the coast like Blackpool, Bournemouth, Brighton, Margate, Scarborough and so on very quickly almost like a gold rush to the to the seaside and so this of course the romantics also inspired the first conservationists and this this um great love for the seaside and our development of it um, uh, caused worries too for the, for the, for the new um, emerging conservationists at the end of the 19th century. The National Trust was created in 1895 and we, we think of it today as a very august sort of um, quite conservative British organisation with its cream teas and stately homes but it actually grew out of the very radical movement to protect the commons of London and um, which was extremely successful and, and the founders of the National Trust had this vision of creating open air sitting rooms for the poor and for working people to be able to enjoy green space much as green space is currently thought of as being beneficial for public health and there's a growing awareness of the health benefits of nature and green space and the very first piece of land that the National Trust acquired and protected was, was this here. It's, it's Dinner Salai in Barmouth, um, overlooking Mid Wales. And, and it's a lovely, fairly ordinary piece of, um, piece of British coastline with beautiful views across the sand there. And in the early days, all of the National Trust's acquisitions, or almost all of them, were coastal. It, they protected places like Barris Nose and Tintagel down in Cornwall. And they protected this place, which is Scott Head Island on the North Norfolk coast. And I wanted to, I was just going to read you a little thing. Um, this is uh, Emma Turner, who was Sc Scott Head Island's first watcher. These days, the National Trust has rangers who wear red polo necks and, um, and range around the place. But in, 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 in those days, they were called watchers. The early naturalists persuaded the National Trust to buy Scott because of its colonies of terns, the chalkwing creatures that nest in their thousands on the island's sandbanks. And a warden has protected these birds from foxes and human thieves ever since. Emma Turner, the Nature Reserve's first watcher, caused a sensation in 1924 when she took up residence in the newly built hut. It was an unusual job for a woman, and Miss Turner was a singular person. Alfred Steers, a Cambridge professor who studied sculpt for 65 years, once found her in the sand dunes engaged in pistol practice, apparently so she could protect herself from unsavoury characters. The most unsavoury character to visit, however, was a gentleman from Fleet Street who dubbed the spinster ornithologist the loneliest woman in England <laughs> for her solitary vocation to protect the island's turn colonies. Other journalists followed in a bewildering stream, recalled Miss Turner in her memoirs, till in desperation I said to the ferryman, drown the next. <laughs> Whatever the ferryman did, it worked, for the unwelcome visit ceased. So um, Emma Turner had two years living on this uninhabited island protecting the turn colonies from these unsavoury characters. And the hut where she lived, the wooden hut, is still there today and it, it looks exactly as it did in Emma Turner's day. And these are the kind of scenes that she would have enjoyed, the great peace and tranquility of the marshes on the North Norfolk coast. Now, 
I'm a great evangelist for the East Anglian coast because I grew up there and I've kind of returned there. But a lot of people, I'm sure a lot of you, probably love the West Coast for, the, for its grand cliffs and its rocky coves. And it's hard to beat the kind of scenic splendour of Cornwall or the Pembrokeshire coast or the Flynn Peninsula or, or even the North Antrim coast in Northern Ireland. But, um, and so scenes like this would probably underwhelm you if you're a fan of the West Coast because there's the grey old North Sea. And I, I went to see as part of my sort of research on artistic inspiration I went to interview Maggie Hambling the artist who and she goes down to Sizewell nuclear power station on the Suffolk coast and puts a stool a meter from the sea and paints these spectacular and wave paintings great detonations of British sea power incredibly colorful and vibrant they've been compared to orgasms um, but I asked her why she would choose the grey old North Sea this this kind of sea and she said well well you're a writer I wouldn't expect you to see color and here's Maggie and, and, and she goes when people say brown or all grey I say go and look again it's full of colour and she goes it's bronze darling the North Sea it's bronze it isn't grey or brown it's bronze and, and here's the same beach Scotthead Island in, in one of its more bronze moments and there's no there's no sort of special filters on that picture or anything like that but um um, after, in, in, the, in the decades following Emma Turner's custodianship of this part of the coast, we, we saw more and more scenes like this um, development on our coastline. The top left image there is Blackpool, but the other three are of Peacehaven um, on the Sussex coast. And I'm sure if you've flown into Gatwick after dark, you see the south coast of England delineated in sodium lights, almost unbroken development along the coast. And a lot of it was really positive. It was, it was very democratic. It was born out of the Plotlands movement that gave working people a chance to buy a cheap patch of land and build a little holiday cabin for themselves or build a dream home for themselves but it was unregulated throughout the 30s and by the 1950s and 60s it was kind of unstoppable and the coastline was disappearing under development at a rate of around eight miles a year and it wasn't just tourism and our love of the coast it was nuclear power stations they were all being built in the 1960s it was things like oil refineries and expansion of container ports and so on so there's a real sense of jeopardy around the coast in the 1960s and so the National Trust launched what um, what was supposed to be a temporary campaign called the Enterprise Neptune now the Neptune Coastline Campaign and they hoped to raise a couple of million quid to save some bits of the coast but it was launched with great fanfare this edition of the Sunday Times magazine was devoted to the campaign it even became a plot line in the arches it was kind of everywhere that year and it proved incredibly successful this was the kind of things that the conservationists of the era were worried about but um, the, the National Trust sent out some young geography students to survey the coast on foot and find out which bits were worth saving and which were, 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 were not worth saving which were already ruined and the surveys of the time it's easy to laugh at them now because they produce these beautifully annotated maps and they obsess over what they called shack development and they were they were very concerned about the coast being subsumed overwhelmed by shack development and of course the shacks they were worried about were these lovely things you know our, our beloved beach huts and, and and the wooden shacks that remain are, are, are very scenic but perhaps they weren't to be honest they weren't particularly worried about these kind of beach huts but the sort of wooden shacks that were built actually on land and then became brick and more, bricks and mortar and then became suburbs and so on so while some of the judgments of the day looked like aesthetic snobbery perhaps to our eyes today in a lot of respects they were sort of ahead of the game in, 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 in conservation circles and set about conserving all this land and the Neptune campaign basically went on and on and ended up it, it saved 775 miles that's in its 50th year now most people don't really know about it but um, old grannies living in Birmingham quietly give their their fortunes to this campaign and and it goes on kind of buying up parts of the coastline and saving it and often you don't realize you're walking along National Trust coast because it's, it's a very sort of British institution, it's very understated. You don't get big signs saying, you are now entering National Trust country. And so you get little, um, little discreet green markers like this. And a third of the coast of Cornwall is now um, protected by the National Trust. So we've created, it's very much, we have created this kind of contemporary common land by the sea because unlike stately homes that the, the Trust doesn't, I, I mean, I wrote the book independently of them, so uh, you know, and I'll criticize them too where, where criticism is due, but they've basically opened it 
it up to the public for free. So it's completely, they're completely committed to public access for their coastal land holdings. So it is very much a contemporary common land by the sea. And a lot of it is places you'd expect, kind of just gorgeously beautiful places. This is why it's Sand Bay around the corner from Land's End. D.H. Lawrence spoke of the Atlantic being all peacock mingled colour. And you really see that in that slide. Or, or um, for example, this is Nangesal Bay in Cornwall, which is that quintessential Cornish cove. But the Trust has also protected lots of unexpected places like this. This is just my favourite National Trust sign with a, with a guy diving head first down the mine shaft. Beware. Beware mine shafts when you're next on the coast. It's protected the ruined coastline of Durham, which was polluted by coal. British coal, as recently as the 1980s, was dumping um, black, um, huge, great um, piles of coal and mine tailings on the sea from, from the coal mines there. And the beaches have been cleaned up. There's still a bit of pollution, but they're wonderfully empty and eerie. And I didn't even know Durham had a coastline before I began this book, but it's got 12 miles and it's gorgeous. So if you're ever up that part of the world, you should definitely take a look. I was amazed at not only by the diversity of the coast, but the diversity of things people do by the sea. We think of the sea as being a kind of family place where we, um, we learn to love it as children. This is some of my family by the sea. We learn to love it as children. We um, then renew our bonds with it as parents, kind of indoctrinating our children in sandcastle building. And then we do the same again as grandparents. But um, there's lots of wonderful things happening by the sea. This was on the Giant's Causeway. And um, this young woman was not performing for anyone. She was just, it was just her way of responding to the beauty of the Giant's Causeway, which is a kind of cathedral of natural or a natural cathedral of sort of worship and then most of the weird things are in Northern Ireland where they use their cars as beach huts like here I don't think I don't think the owners of this car quite realized um, that the tide was coming very fast and then I thought I was in Goa when I oh I thought I was in Goa when I saw this site again in and in one of the beautiful um, uh, beaches of North Antrim which is a wonderful part of the world to visit but I guess the obvious thing is that I found by the sea was tranquility and solace and I think in a sort of age where many of us have relinquished religion to be in the company of a power so much mightier than you like the sea and something so eternal as the sea Conrad wrote about how the sea can never look young like the land can in spring the sea is the oldest thing there is and I think being in its company makes us feel very small and that's a very very profoundly comforting thing for us because it makes our fears and anxieties seem very small as well. And um, I sort of struggled to uh, sum this up in 80,000 words in a book and then of course I discovered that the romantic poets had got their way before me. George Byron did it in, in four lines. Here he is. There is rapture on the lonely shore. There is society where none intrudes. By the deep sea and music in its roar, I love not man the less, but nature more. And I was watching at this point the sunset over the Norfolk coast into the Lynn and Inner Dowsing Wind Farm. And you can just see it there, probably, the wind farm on the horizon. But um, that's an interesting... It didn't destroy the beauty of it for me, but it's an interesting challenge for the future because um, we've been tremendously successful at preserving our coastal landscape. It's a really happy story, but climate change and our hunger for energy will um, challenge our conservation of seascapes once more in the future. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>